I'm actually going to give you a little bit of an update as to where we are initially, uh, and then I'll get on to the, uh, to the learnings. Um, I just wanted to remind you what the clinical effects of influenza are. In totally susceptible animals, so not vaccinated, this is a significant disease characterised by its uh, coughing. Uh, <coughs> pardon me. <coughs> <laughs> the, uh, the high temperature, uh, there can be weight loss, you can get the nasal discharge, but it's the speed of spread uh, amongst infected animals that, that's really important here. And if these animals do get secondary uh, infections, it can be fatal. So it's not something to be underestimated. And this is the effect that this virus will have. This is a normal lining of the, the airway of the horse. This virus comes in, and within three days, it's starting to disrupt the normal function of this part of, uh, of, of the horse. And by six days, it's lost the lining uh, to its trachea. And this is when the horse will be very sensitive to coughing, and it can only cough to clear its, uh, clear its airways. So how does flu spread? Um, well, flu, unlike other infections like strangles and herpes, has a fairly narrow window of opportunity by which it has to then infect the next horse and keep its life cycle going. And this does present us with opportunities to control this infection. So uh, breaking that chain of transmission is really important. And vaccination is really key to that because it will reduce the severity of signs. It will reduce the amount of virus that's going in. And in this schematic here, it will effectively hopefully take us from a healthy, susceptible horse, missing out the clinical signs and the infectious period, and delivering a healthy immune animal. But we know that as vaccines uh, age and they get further away from the, the infecting viruses, then they will let work less well and we will start to see signs emerging and infectious horses uh, that have been vaccinated. And that's key to what we're seeing at the moment. Just a quick word on the surveillance activities that we conduct at the Animal Health Trust. We have the Diagnostic Laboratory Services, uh, fulfilling a function for, for veterinary surgeons investigating disease. We also benefit and have done for a long time now from support from the Horse Race Betting Levy Board, uh, conducting uh, a surveillance initiative with subsidised testing there. And we ha have a hookup with one of the vaccine manufacturers who again will provide a, a, a range of tests uh, free of charge to uh, clients of of their, of their of veterinary surgeons that use those products, and they will look for a range of pathogens which does include flu. So what does this mean? Well, the surveillance has, they're all long established. We haven't drastically changed that over the years, but we do see a changing pattern of infection as these numbers here indicate. Back in 2014, we started to see quite a lot of disease here, and we got quite excited and thought this was where we might be seeing the vaccine starting not to work. But actually what we saw was the reverse. The numbers of diagnoses went down over the years, such that in 2018 we only confirmed disease due to equine influenza on two occasions in the UK, and that's with over 800 samples that were, diagnosed, that, that were run for this particular test. So you can see we've got a very low detection rate for the virus in, in that whole year. Important to also say that up to the end of 2017 we were dealing with a Florida clade 2 virus, and that will become important why, why, why I'm mentioning that. And we could track this virus all the way back to 2003 when we'd had the last major outbreak of flu that affected horses, particularly in, uh, in Newmarket, but in other parts of the country as well. So then we get to the beginning of this year, and you'll see from that table there, we're not very long into it, and we get our first confirmed diagnoses. Within less than three weeks, we've, more than dou we've doubled our 2018 total. We've got four confirmations all in non-vaccinated animals. But what was important was we were seeing a different type of virus here, Florida clade 1, something we hadn't really seen in the UK in any, in any time since um, 2009. So we not only had the changing activity early on in 2019 in the UK, we were also seeing or hearing of reports coming out of mainland Europe, a letter by Roman Peo, a former colleague at the Animal Health Trust, to the veterinary record highlighted the extent of the problem in France and the links through in the northern border with Belgium, again reporting a Florida clade 1 virus. We attended the BHA Veterinary Committee on the 24th of January. They were updated as to this going on and that's when the first recommendation went out to trainers to be vaccinating horses more frequently. Um, and the reports from Europe were indicating that this was breaking through vaccination at that time. We had to wait a little bit longer before we had our first example there. So on the 4th of February, we had 
uh, confirmation of vaccinated thoroughbreds in a pre-training yard just outside Newmarket, 8 out of 15 positives, vaccinated horses with clinical signs of flu. The real game changer, I guess, in terms of the publicity around this disease came on the 6th of February, Wednesday, when vaccinated thoroughbred racehorses in an active yard in Cheshire were found to have uh, this infection. And they had sent runners out that, the day of that diagnosis, and this obviously caused uh, some concern that we may be on the brink of seeing flu circulating through the very highly connected racing network. So it was decision time at that point for British racing. This is when it made the headlines, and working closely with the BHA and uh, their staff and David's team, and the BHA Veterinary Committee, who I think deserve a lot of credit, the, the difficult decision was made to cancel racing, and then very quickly after that to extend that to the 13th of February, when the, uh, and this was based on the potential for this spreading quite rapidly through a highly connected network. And so, for example, 174 yards linked through five race meetings could track back very quickly to thousands of, uh, thousands of horses. So we needed to allow ourselves time to assess the situation and to ramp up our capability to, to deal with that. So we did have a bit of a swab party on the weekend of the 9th and 10th. These are swabs coming in, these are swabs going out. Obviously a lot of demand there. This is the cold room at the HT where we're banking up samples ready to go through our system. And then when they've come through, these are the samples, thousands of them coming out at the other end. Three things really that uh, allowed this to, to work. Uh, we changed the design of the swabs. We had high throughput uh, QPCR and extraction robots, really important, and great staff. And I would just acknowledge the way that the BHA staff integrated with uh, AHT staff uh, and worked great as a, as a team. So I'm getting the, uh, the push on here. So this is just uh, a, a, a sort of an outbreak curve, but these are the samples coming through our system. And so in that week there, before we got racing going again, we processed well over four probably nearly 5,000 samples. Just to compare this, we had 62 days in 2003 where we processed just over 2,000 samples. So the situation now is we've got it in these parts of the country. We've had 40, 41. It's actually now probably uh, above that now, 40-plus uh, confirmed outbreaks, some involving vaccinated animals, some obviously involving thoroughbreds. Many have been linked to new arrivals, particularly coming in from Ireland, and mixing, such as through hunts, and animals being left unvaccinated have all contributed to this. So what are the lessons that we want to learn? Well, scaling up of the lab uh, capacity, I think, is really important. We, we're in a much better place than we were in 1989-2003 for the reasons that I've already outlined. But I think if we want to deal with a really big threat, which would be the brand new flu virus that we don't know or the African horse sickness, then we need to be ramping up our ability to be able to process lots of samples, and that will need investment in laboratory infrastructure and equipment. Touching on the use of the century collated equine uh, database, uh, I think you've already heard what a great um, benefit this, this could bring. It will allow us to target disease messaging out to the entire population. It will allow us to do local evaluation of vaccination coverage. People can check where they are and what, what those risks are. I think we can have safer events with the pre-event registration and vaccina vaccination record checking. And there's a really exciting here where we could actually trace high-risk animals, and this would be particularly true where we're dealing with exotic disease. I think we do need to op optimise our vaccination in the future. It's a long process to get updated vaccines through, and this will unfortunately take several years if the recommendation comes in April to, to do that. So we will have to use our current vaccines uh, in a smarter way. And one way that we can do that, and we know this from mathematical modelling, is to use them more frequently and they will do a better job. Also, I think there needs to be a harmonisation of the vaccination rules across different disciplines. And we've been putting, trying to put this in place for a little while now, and hopefully the door will be well and truly open that we can do that. These will be scientific-based new rules that do provide some flexibility. That is required. And again, these are the ideas, but I won't go into detail here. And lastly, I think using respected Sources of information providing consistent messaging is really important. The benefits of vaccination and isolation in order to break these chains of transmission is a really simple concept, but we've probably not been getting that over enough. And we've been trying through this sort of infographic here that we've produced at the Animal Health Trust, but unfortunately these simple messages are certainly being missed by some horse owners, and I think also more worryingly by event organisers and their veterinary advisors. And so I just want to end 
by likening this to a Brexit-type vote. Article 50 is not at stake here, but who out of these two would possibly get your, your vote? I'm going to refer to an article by Lee Mottershead, which appeared in the Racing Post on Monday the 18th of February. I think it was a nicely considered piece, and I would say that, wouldn't I? But it's this quote here. Uh, it is not, however, the job of a governing body to play fast and loose with the industry it is charged with protecting. For that reason, more than any other, the BHA in this instance deserves not criticism but praise and gratitude. And I would just contrast that with this uh, Facebook entry that I uh, came across or I was directed towards and then I read through a long dialogue that followed this. And this is um, from a particular county show on seeking advice from several equine veterinary experts. At this moment in time, they are not imposing a ban on entering this particular show due to no vaccination. But interestingly, they do, however, advise that those who um, are in the vaccination programme do maintain uh, that up to date. So that was very good. So on that point, I will um, say thank you. Okay.